All right, today we're gonna start off with the lyrics of a really amazing song. If you're lost, you can look and you will find me time after time. That's what we're all about at apushexplain.com. Joe's Productions, we got your back time after time because today, we're breaking down. If you're lost, you can look and you will find me. Important dates and periods in U.S. history from 1491 to 1877. These are the key things you should know. You should know these dates and kind of know the order of things. So let's just get started. 1491, really important. That's pre-Columbian exchange. So before Columbus, before the Europeans arrive. And make sure you know about the Native American diversity, right? A lot of Native tribes are adapting to their environments and there's a lot of unique cultures. 1492, Columbus discovers the New World. This begins the process of colonization. Spain's first, but many others will follow. In fact, Spain is first in the colonization of North America, what will be the United States, at St. Augustine in 1588. But in 1607, Jamestown will be founded, the English colony, and that is the first permanent settlement. Remember, they tried to establish a colony, Roanoke, and it bails. A year later, the French will be establishing their own colony at Quebec. And throughout 1607 to 1700s, it's really about colonization. You have the English, the French, the Spanish, and the Dutch colonizing the Western Hemisphere and what will be the United States. A couple things you should keep in mind is English colonization is going to be very regionally uh each area is going to be characterized by their region. So you have the New England colonies, the middle colonies the southern colonies, and this includes the Chesapeake region, and of course the West Indies as well. And there is periods of solitary neglect during this period. And what that means is England's not going to really manage the colonies as closely as they would have liked because they're dealing with internal and external issues. 1676 is another date you should remember. That's Bacon's Rebellion in the Chesapeake colony of Virginia. That leads to the transition or the growth of slavery from indentured servants to slaves. And of course, in 1680, you have the Pueblo Revolt where Spain suffers a setback in their colonization when native people uh, rebel. Some more dates throughout the 1700s. This is a period of colonial development. So you have colonial societies uh, emerging in both the British and the French and other colonies. 1730s to 1750s, you have the Great Awakening moving across the colonies. One of these shared experiences that all the colonists are going to kind of... One of the few things that unites them, and of course a big one, is 1754. This is the start of the French and Indian War, as it's known in North America or the Seven Years' War, as it know, is known in Europe. Make sure you know 1763. This is the end of the French and Indian War. This is going to have huge consequences. I even put it in red because no more solitary neglect. The British are going to focus on the colonies. They're going to implement and enforce their mercantile laws, such as the Navigation Acts and a whole bunch of other taxes, which leads me to this period, 1763 to 1775, is really a lot of tension between the colonies and their mama. And you're going to see a lot of things. Here's some of the highlights, the Quartering Act, the Stamp Act, the Tea Act, the Coercive Acts. You don't need to memorize those dates, you know, but just know that they're all kind of going on during this time of 1763 to 1775. And of course, 1775, we are the eve of the Declaration of Independence, and the fighting actually begins before we declare our independence at Lexington and Concord. A couple more dates, of course, 1776, that's why we eat the hot dogs and shoot off the fireworks, the Declaration of Independence. You know, earlier in the year, you have Thomas Paine's Common Sense. And of course, from 1776 to 1783, you have the American Revolution, and a couple of highlights of that, the Battle of Saratoga, that's an important battle because after that, the French officially join the United States, the colonies, in an alliance. We become homies with France, and the treaty that ends the war, the Treaty of Paris of 1783. And oftentimes they're going to ask you, you know, how was 1783 a turning point? Did the American Revolution change things a lot politically, socially, or economically? In 1787, you have the Constitutional Convention, goodbye Articles of Confederation. Remember, Shays' Rebellion showed the Articles was weak. There were other problems with the Articles, and so they decide in 1787 to meet up and to draft a new government, which goes into effect in 1789. The new government under the Constitution is basically put in force, and George Washington 
Jorge Washington becomes president, and they're going to adopt the Bill of Rights. Remember, that's to make the anti-federalists happy to, you know, guarantee protections against government power. 1790s this is all going to be about George Washington and John Adams. You have the first party system. We're talking the Federalists versus, versus the Democratic Republicans. And a lot of stuff going on, a lot of battles between the Secretary of the Treasury, Alexander Hamilton, and Thomas Jefferson. There's the issue over the bank, the tariff, and of course, we have the Kentucky and Virginia resolutions by Jefferson and Madison against the Federalist policies in the Alien and Sedition Act. In 1800, it's an important year because Thomas Jefferson is elected. And this, of course, is the first peaceful transition of power. The Federalists are never going to serve in the presidency again, and the Constitution worked. In the period 1800 to 1860, there's no exact date. You have the market revolution going on. You know, textile mills in the New England areas. The South is growing their cotton. So you have transportation improvements. That's going on throughout this period. In 1803, you have the Louisiana Purchase, one of the best real estate deals ever. Thomas Jefferson gets a huge chunk of land from Napoleon. And, of course, our first declared war, 1812 to 1814, under the new Constitution, is the War of 1812, fighting our mama again. And, of course, during that war, you have the Hartford Convention, which really hurts the F Federalist Party because they're seen as traitors. 1814 to 1824, make sure you know about it. It's the so-called era of good feelings. You know, there's only one major political party. The Federalists are fading away roughly by around 1817, 1818. But was it really an era of good feelings? Because there were debates over Henry Clay's American system, the Second Bank of the United States, the Tariff of 1816, all of which is a part of the American system. So the Republican Party is divided, or the Democratic Republican Party is divided amongst themselves. Big kind of period, I put it in red, 1820 to 1860, you're going to have a lot of sectional conflict. And this really comes down to, as the nation expands west, as we get more land, and the issue is going to be slavery in the territories. This is going to lead to drama. An example of that drama is, of course, the Missouri Compromise, where they have a big old fight over what to do about admitting Missouri as a slave state, and they figure it out with the Compromise, which calms sectional tension temporarily. 1823, just know about the Monroe Doctrine, kind of our message to Europe and exerting ourselves on the world stage. And a big moment again is 1828, when Andrew Jackson is elected President of the United States. He takes office in 1829. And Andrew Jackson kind of symbolizes, amongst many, this age of the common man. Um, there's also, at this time frame, an age of reform going on with a lot of different reforms. Make sure you know about those reforms in the early 19th century. Keep in mind, there are going to be crises that you should know about. The big one is the nullification crisis of 1833. Jackson battling the state of South Carolina over tariffs. And in 1838, you have the Trail of Tears, the forced removal of the Cherokee people. 1828 to 1854, you have the second party system. This, we're talking about the Whigs versus the Democrats. The Whigs emerged during Jackson's presidency, protesting his policies, particularly his war on the bank. And 1845 to 1849, Polk is elected in 44, takes the presidency, and he's really known for this, fulfilling the goals of Manifest Destiny, annexing Texas, taking Oregon, California, and much more. So know about Polk in that time frame of the 1840s. Can't talk about Polk without talking about the Mexican-American War, which lasts for a little less than two years. And in 1848, not only does the Mexican-American War end with the Treaty of Guadalupe Hidalgo, but also women meet with the Seneca Falls Convention. And this is seen as the birth of the women's rights movement, women's suffrage in the country. And the Mexican-American War creates problems which eventually get temporarily resolved with the Compromise of 1850. California will be admitted as a free state, but the South's going to get a Fugitive Slave Act, which leads us throughout the 1850s, you have sectional crisis. Lots of sectional tension. The North hates the Fugitive Slave Act. Kansas-Nebraska Act destroys the Whig Party. You have Dred Scott. You have Bleeding Kansas. There's a lot of sectional tension. So no, 1850s, sectional tensions. Um, and in that same period, post-1854, after Kansas-Nebraska, you get the emergence of the third party system, the Republicans versus the Democrats. The Whigs are goodbye, say farewell. 
And in 1860, Lincoln is elected, which begins secession, South Carolina being the first one to leave. And that'll lead us to, following Fort Sumter, the Civil War, which will take place from 1861 to 1865. And some key things you should know in terms of dates, the Battle of Antietam, which is important not only from a military standpoint, but eventually leads to Lincoln announcing the Emancipation Proclamation. And during the war, even before it ends, before 1865, you have Reconstruction, the re process of bringing the Union back together, dealing with a post-slavery America, and you're going to get some amendments, some very important amendments, the 13th, the 14th, and 15th Amendments, but Reconstruction will be a temporary revolution in some ways, because in 1877, it will come to an end. Remember, there's the election of 1876, it's disputed between Rutherford B. Hayes, and following that, there's a compromise of 1877, which ends Reconstruction, and you get the rise of Jim Crow laws, sharecropping, etc. Make sure you check out apushexplained.com. If you scroll to the bottom of the page on the review section, click right there. You will come across all sorts of cool, helpful information, but you will also come across right here, the period one to five timeline, all the stuff you just saw broken down for you. I recommend you print it and just add some annotations and just know these time periods, these dates. These are the core ones. You know these. You should be good for periods one through five. As always, if the video helped you out, make sure you click like, post any comments that you may have, and have a beautiful day. Peace.